Mark? Okay, great stuff. So, Rob, can you see the screen? Can you give us a thumbs up? All good. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, thanks very much, Rob, and thanks for, for the opportunity and and the, the, the introduction to, to the Moodle Room session. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to whiz through the, the slides here, really, because I, I want to show the uh, Paula and uh, Bayad what they've actually been doing for it, but I think it's appropriate to give a little bit of background. I'm just going to set a timer to make sure Rob doesn't give out to me over time, so let me go. There we go. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, got a bit ambitious there and hit the, hit the key too quick. The... Um, Background. So we had a huge increase in the use of digital tools, as everybody else did throughout COVID, and um, some of which were using collaborative tools that we didn't necessarily recommend. Didn't recommend for a number of reasons, whether it's accessibility, whether it's data protection, or, or just usability. Um, but we had no control over what lectures were using, and uh, when we had no uh, decent substitute to give them, they just carried on regardless. So whether the information came from our, our survey, which is our student uh, engagement survey, the index survey, or whether it was just from word of mouth, we found out these tools were being used and that they were needed to be used. So we wanted to um, <clears throat> not restrict the lectures, but address our concerns, re privacy and accessibility and so on. Um, <clears throat> so what we looked for or what we saw uh, sourced was some funding to do a little bit of development. And what we wanted was a post-it board, uh, a post-it the, the likes of what was really popular with Padlet and Lino and Wallwisher and all those sorts of stuff. And we'd identified just from feedback from staff, a key sort of stuff. We wanted it in multiple formats. They wanted to be able to rate the post. They wanted to be able to sort them, all sorts of basic functionality. And what we uh, done then was we had designed within DCU, we designed it a uh, we could probably fund about a quarter of what we wanted. So <clears throat> uh, we had enlisted Brickfield Education Labs, who were the main developers. Um, we then approached at Loan uh, Institute of Technology, as it was known at the time, it's now uh, Technological University of Shannon, um, and also colleagues in uh, UCL in London. And we sort of said, well, we can fund X. If you give us a little bit more, can uh, we can fund the development of Y and Z. Long story short, uh, we were able to get the funding to develop it to a, a sort of a minimal viable product. And of course, from our perspective, and indeed at loans, we must acknowledge that our funding came from the National Forum, and we're very grateful for that. That's the, the TNL logo there, the National Forum for Teaching and Learning. So what does it look like? Just because I am conscious of time and want to speak through it, it, it allows, it's an activity within uh, Moodle that allows a user to add a post. So here's one I prepared earlier. And uh, you'll see there, there's four columns, some of which I have text in, others I have videos, others I have images, and others I have URLs. Uh, so there are the, the options that you have available. And if you want to add another column, the plus in the in the top right hand corner will allow you to do that. And if you want to add a, another note in any one of the columns, you just press one of the pluses at the bottom of each one of the column. And when you press it, it gives you the option to enter in a title text and then web link uh, image or YouTube clip. So that's that's what it looks like. And Rob, if you don't mind putting the link to this presentation in the chat box, people will have access to the slides afterwards. And I've placed in a, a YouTube video where you can hear the dulcet tones of Rob Lowney uh, walking you through how, how it's actually used and how to set it up, okay? Um, <clears throat> so where are we at now at the moment? We're launched just over a year and uh, we've over 700, I think 769 different uh, institutions have downloaded this particular plugin. It's available for anybody to use. Um, and it's proven already very popular. I, I think I heard it was in the top 100 uh, plugins of, of its type. There's a ton of things you can use these notes for. And again, full list of ideas. And with the link that Rob will put in the chat, you can click into them. But whether it's exit tickets, whether it's reflections, whether it's brainstorming, whatever the case may be, and we'll hear some of our colleagues going through them later on, some of their applications, but there are a ton of stuff that you can actually do with it. The most popular is exit tickets. But <clears throat> what I wanted to show you was 
we um, and there's, there's resources available for people to to uh, sift through our blogs of, of current users. But what we want to do is do a pilot uh, evaluation of our pilot. So we looked at it across 11 modules and uh, we surveyed this, the students with 600 plus students, 680 students and 11 staff associated with them. <clears throat> and we asked them a series of questions, which I'll go through on, on the next slide. Our response rate for staff was brilliant with 91%. Uh, our response rate for our students wasn't as brilliant, but 6% is 40 odd students. So it's still decent enough, but, but not great. What sort of questions do we ask are outlined here in this slide. I don't expect you to read the whole lot um, of the content, but I just wanna highlight to you, the more blue you see on the screen, the better. Um, the, if you're looking at, at question two, it's all blue. There's no orange and there's no red. There's, so the orange and the red will be disagree and strongly disagree. And you will see there the, the large um, dominance of the, of the blue color there. And we're, if we're looking at uh, question eight, it gave me an insight, Loop Board, so Loop is their local name for Moodle, gave me an insight into students' learning issues and ideas. So that was 100%, they agreed with that. 100% um, there, if we look at question 12, Loop Board helped me foster a positive learning environment. I'm not gonna go through each one of the, the, the responses and, uh, and you can do that at your leisure to when you have the presentation, but the overwhelmingly, an incredibly positive response from, from the staff. And remember, we've only piloted this by expecting much larger uptake over the next, uh, the coming semester and beyond. <clears throat> the students, um, again, very, very positive, predominantly blue in there, just looking at, at some of the questions that stick out for me. Um, I enjoyed being able to in, uh, browse other students' contributions. Um, browsing other students, uh, or sorry, use, using, browsing other students' contributions helped me integrate knowledge into my class. A hugely positive, um, for the large, uh, large majority of cases, hugely positive um, feedback that we're getting for it. A loop board helped enhance my learning experience, or I would like to see, and this is the biggest one for me, I would like to see my lecturers continue to use loop board. So all really, really positive um, responses from, from the, both the staff and the student side of things. But what I want to do now, and, and I'll come back to wrap up afterwards, what I want to do now is to pass you on to my colleague, um, Paula, who's going to just give an insight as to how she used it. Paula. Hi everyone, um, as Mark said, my name is Paula and I'm an assistant professor with DCU School of Inclusive and Special Education in the Institute of Education. And during my work last term with my undergraduate groups, I use Moodle boards quite a lot to encourage engagement and discussion amongst my students, but also to support my own formative assessment practices. And what I'm going to do now, just for the next two minutes, is take you through three different Moodle boards that I use with my third and fourth year undergraduate students. And like what Mark said, the way that the Moodle boards are designed allows you to really quickly and effectively make exit tickets. And this is an exit ticket I use with a group of third years after a session on how to write literature reviews. And in the first column, you can see that I asked the students to identify a piece of key learning for them, something that they really understood in the session. And then I also asked them to identify something that they're not quite sure about, something that they'd like me to return back to. And you can see very quickly there that they really liked understanding how to thematically organize their ideas into a plan of attack. But in terms of what I probably need to go back to, they want more guidance on paraphrasing. And what I did with this loop board was that in around three weeks time, when I returned to the topic of literature reviews, I spent a few more minutes than expected on paraphrasing so that the students' responses really informed my own teaching. And then at the final column, I do this with all my exit tickets. I just have general questions that I'll try to address in future sessions. So that's one example of a loop board. I also find the Moodle boards really useful to use when showing videos to my students. 
to really make sure that they're actually engaging with what I'm showing them rather than just passively, you know, sitting there and pretending to listen. And what I ask them to do, I ask them to just comment on the videos I'm showing them. What do they agree with? Do they disagree with anything? Is there something surprising? Do they have a question? And then what I do is that I display these posts to my students and I have it set up so that it's anonymous. So it's a very safe way for the students to share their thoughts and ideas. And I scroll down through them and I might make a comment, but it's a really good way to get, do you know that brave first responder in a class discussion? You can get them in a lot faster and get the discussion started quicker when they have something to base it on, something safe like this. And then the last board I used was to support a group project in um, my class. So there was around 40 people in the class and the class was divided into six groups and each group was asked to investigate a strategy for developing an inclusive primary classroom. And once they had done their research, I asked them to post what they thought other people needed to know to their relevant column. And just like Mark showed you there, you can see that some people have put in links to Google Docs that have specific interventions, pictures of resources they can use in the classroom, or key topics and ideas. And what this board did is um, facilitated a really good in-depth discussion um, about each of these strategies, but it also um, allowed the students themselves to have access to a repository of resources for their own future practices as teachers that they could browse through, just like Mark highlighted in the, the student survey. So that was a very much a whistle stop tour through my use of Moodle boards. Um, I really enjoyed them and I hope you've gotten some ideas for them. So I'll pass you on to Bayez now. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Baid, Baidyanath Bishwas. So I work as the Assistant Professor of Digital Business in the DCU Business School. So I have been using these loop boards once it was introduced. Uh, so I will take this opportunity to thank the DCU TU team for their wonderful support and contribution towards the teaching staff. In particular, I would like to mention Shadi Karasi and Rob Lowney for their incredible inputs towards helping me during loop boards using them and whenever there was a challenge. So typically I use the loop boards for two modules. One was undergrad module. The module was titled SB 105, Digital Business Ecosystems. So a little bit of technology and a strategy for digital transformation. And I also used it for one postgraduate module, Digital Marketing Mechanics, MG 5000. So the response was excellent. And typically I would use loop boards for three purposes. Number one, to ask students to answer questions from a pre-assigned reading or watching of videos and then report their findings and reflections before coming to the lecture room. While this is mostly an asynchronous mode of interaction because I'm unable to see the student face to face when they're putting in their inputs. Number two, I often ask students to write down their reflections and thoughts on the class learnings, takeaways and challenges. So this is uh, often asynchronous, sometimes at a time in the class. And this is very similar to the exit ticket that you have already seen from Mark's slides. So I learned this quick tip from the TUA circulated. And number three, sometimes I ask students to work upon a classroom exercise. And this is often a synchronous mode of interaction. I ask them to watch a video or do a classroom reading. And then anticipating their responses, I ask them and encourage them to put their answers on the questions that I have posted through the loop boards. And how I find using it. So typically loop boards are very much easier to elicit responses for me from the students in both physical as well as online mode of lectures. So often students would be shy and unresponsive in the lecture room, but loop boards, once they're being available and they're anonymous to the student view, they could easily write on them and make the class discussion interactive and flowing. Number two, it has a very colorful format similar to post-its. And as a teaching staff myself, I also enjoy asking reflections and teaching inputs from using loop boards. 
So in future, I still continue to use loop boards for all these three types of activities. Additionally, I think I'm also going to ask my students to use loop boards during group project work and their daily activities when they're recording the group project. So it's same like what Paula has shown. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just wrap up. I know I, I have about 30 seconds left, so I'll whiz through it. Um, <clears throat> where to next? What we want to be able to do is to improve the functionality where we can set activity completions on it. A student must add a certain amount of posts before it's complete, very similar to the discussion form functionality. Um, <clears throat> we also want to set it where it's a board per student, so it's an individual private board. Um, and then uh, where we we'll, you can currently download a CSV export of a two different types. One you can use for an assignment, allows you to, to add it to the gradebook, but another one allows you to see who has posted uh, and what posts they've said. Um, we want to add to that the number of likes that the particular post gets, so then you can um, figure out uh, who got the most likes in the post or, or, or sort them accordingly. And then the other one is to enable a commenting uh, functionality on each post. Um, so there are the, the four different bits that we would like to add to it and would love your input here today on what else we could add to it and um, see how we make it better for everybody. Thanks very much, Rob. We'll, we'll hand over to you, Michael, if that's all right. Thanks. Uh, okay, so this is the slide you, you are on, Stephen, at present. Is that right? Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, off you go, Stephen. Can you hear me, yeah? We can hear you now at the moment, yeah. Yeah, I'll step in if it fails again, okay. So you can carry on, Michael. Okay. Next one. So that was 40,000 learners. We have two and a half thousand courses. Um, what, are what are students, what is it like to be a learner in our centers? We have small classes. We hear them. We listen to them. We treat them as equals. We try to build support for access to technology. What is it like to be an educator within, our, within CD, City Dublin ETB? We commit, the commitment of staff, we try to do as much upskilling and CPD as possible. Um, academic integrity. Our stakeholders, right, you can carry on, Michael, because time. Um, our stakeholders, these are all the stakeholders that we, we are committed to um, supporting. And obviously, learners is at the top there. So because of time constraints, constraints we'll move on. Um, our, so we asked our educators the key words in relation to the professional development they did around during the COVID time around technology. So you can see Moodle is there. It's been, it's been talked about a lot over the last year, how we can utilize it much better than the way we were doing it. And all the other sort of digital technologies terms there is coming up a lot. So our educators are willing and waiting and wanting to, to keep embracing all this technology. All right, Michael. So what are we? We've 26 Moodle sites. We've 26 Moodle administrators which is a challenge for us. It's not like a traditional sort of college. We have to, we have these sites where we have to manage internally. So what we do is we have a Moodle administrator within each of these sites, all our colleges. Okay. So our Moodle planning, we ask ourselves, what is our current situation? Where do we want to go to? What does best practice look like? And how do we get there? So they're the questions we want to, to, to ask ourselves all the time. And our objectives then is we want short-term wins to get, the, to get a bit of focus back into Moodle and to know and to get everyone thinking about how we can actually be productive in the way we're using it. So little short-term wins, focus long-term. We're always thinking what is down the road, a culture of sharing. And the two big ones there, sites standardization, with a consistency over our 26 sites. And then obviously the last one is really important, a Moodle support and coordinator. So someone who is the go-to person for all our sites. So how do we standardize Moodle? So we have 26 sites and we want to have the same integrations. The same. We don't want them to look the same, but to do the same things, themes, plugins. The key thing here is educator and learner experience that they have a good experience in Moodle. And if they're going from college to college, that experience is kind of the same, but it needs support. 
what is a Moodle administrator. They're on the ground, they're in our colleges. They might only have a two or three hours or two or three classes off to do all this work. Student enrollment, great book construction, looking at plugins. And what is what happened was that if one college got a plugin, the other colleges would never hear about it. And that was a problem. How do our administrators get talking to each other? So we developed a community of practice around Moodle. So in this community of practice, we came together and we focused this with, with the support of principals that we'd have a one hour meeting every month where we come together as a community and talk about all the good things and all the successes and failures in relation to Moodle. So this is some of our learning intentions. So what it, why, why are we coming into, what is a community of practice? Like, what does it look like? What's the elements of a community of practice? And this is a really key point. And then we talk about Moodle and the success and failures is the key to focus all the time because there's always both. Um, a typical um, agenda. So we often use one of the videos from Moodle Munch to watch and then to reflect on it. Can we learn something there? Because we're trying to learn what is best practice out there. We might have an overview of a college's site to see what they're doing. And everyone is listening and everyone's asking questions. And it's a really sort of inform informative hour of learning for everyone. Um, other, other topics that could be on a typical meeting. So like you're probably all familiar with that. Really important topics that have to be discussed and not in the silo together. And what, like we, I, this is a slide that I'd always put up at the beginning of it because there's new people sometimes. We have administrators who might start new, and it's the social learning, it's the sharing of ideas and the common problems. Um, these are ones I'd, we look at. One of these, I ask, what's your one? What stands out to you? I always go down to the last one celebrating success and failures because we're a safe space in this community of practice. What, the things of what's going on in your centres in relation to how to work with mood with your teachers, let's, let's, let's share them because they're probably going on in other centres as well. So that's shared sort of experience. Are we connecting? How can we connect? Who can we connect to? We're a big organisation, lots of different Moodle sites, but if you're by yourself, it's quite difficult. So we need to connect and that's our objective. Right, so now I'm going to pass you over to Michael. Michael is going to zoom through this bit. Um, it's about how we integrate it, because we have two platforms at play. We have a Microsoft 365 communication and collaboration platform, plus we've Moodle for, for, for years. So we're trying to integrate them and align them together. And that's a big challenge. So Michael's just going to talk about it some, a little bit there in relation to site standardization. Okay, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much, Stephen, for passing that over to me. Um, yeah, okay. So as Stephen said, we've got, two pillars, so Moodle and Microsoft 365. The, together, they've been used in a disconnected manner. So until recently, we've started to improve that. Uh, so and that was the negative effects, just to what the challenges were. Just signing in to two different accounts so it causes confusion for learners, duplication of files, and then all the errors that are associated with that, uh, you know, changes in one place not made in the other. So the benefits of this integration are based to, you know, you're effectively trying to create a single hub of learning yet using two platforms. So that's really the, the crux of the challenge that we have with this. Okay, so the integration, uh, it started with the key focuses on linking up the 365 user accounts with the Moodle accounts using a protocol, OpenID Connect. It's called. So this is to build on top of our existing features that link with Microsoft, such as the OneDrive repository, uh, calendars syncing up, and uh, the Teams plugin, which we had we had already. So there's a lot of interactions required with these different uh, parties involved in this. So we our Sulla site is managed. Our our Moodle site, is, apologies, is provided by Sullis for all the ETBs, and there is third party support to assist Sullis in the management of those. So they are uh, they were heavily involved in this project. That's innovation. Um, so they are required to be coordinated with our own ETB department, who hold the reins to the all of the three six five account settings and the Azure administration that was required as well. So those are all kind of as far as we're concerned. There's there's sort of separate stakeholders to us that have to be all coordinated in order to get anywhere with this project. So that was one of the main the main challenges. Uh, and not to last, but definitely not least, the local Moodle admins who, this is who I'm 
talking about here today. So um, the summary of the kind of key aspects are there, all, all the different uh, technicalities, just, they're just listed there to give an idea of it. It's um, of what was involved. So I will leave that for now in the interests of time and go straight on to just a diagram of the three different stakeholders and how they were uh, required to interact. And so, uh, for example, the local admi uh, Moodle administrator had to identify kind of a safe time period that their usernames could be updated on their Moodle sites. So these are times when there's no ass assessment coming in or anything like that. Um, and this has to be coordinated with the same time when the IT department are ready to switch to adjust the 365 and Azure admin settings and like this PowerShell uh, scripts and everything like that has to be managed. So innovation oversaw that process. So it's working very well and our, uh, it's not fully complete, I understand, but uh, we're certainly making good progress through it. It's successful so far. The community of practice that we set up that Stephen has mentioned already amongst our Moodle administrators has been very helpful with that um, and that process. And uh, I suppose, you know, being able to exchange information on through the community has been in, in, invaluable throughout the process. So just some other things that we're discussing uh, are listed out there. So basically each Moodle site, as Stephen said, was, uh, historically worked independently from all the others if they wanted to inst add something or change something they would be required to um, talk to the third party provider um, providing support they wouldn't go do other Moodle administrators wouldn't hear about it necessarily so this is the, the first step along the way to integrating all that and just briefly a quick win is the last one which was the external authentication process. So that's our kind of end of year correction settings. So last year, in the last two years, when this all became online, the community of practice had a significant contribution into uh, a, basically a brief win for, for this. So uh, we created an, an, a new role, it was a Moodle role uh, called external authenticator, which basically gave them access to the grade book and, and assessment submissions, but nothing else within the site. So that was uh, a, that was um, able to protect the teaching materials because there's a culture of protection in the, within the organisation, kind of long-standing things. People don't want to risk giving up their their work. So that that was a very important uh, victory. I kind of got a lot of buy-in from people when they realised Moodle can do be useful to do this kind of thing, and that's something it could be used for. Um, and I'll just leave that that slide up before I hand back over to Stephen. And then. That one just did some of the roles that they do. But Stephen, are you ready to take over? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, apologies for um, the beginning of it. I flew through it, probably have a bit more time than I thought. But anyway, so I suppose just feeding back into where we're at and what we want to really achieve with our cloud based platforms, Moodle in the core of our communication and collaboration sort of and teach and learn an assessment platform. We want to align the two of them. And it's really, we find it really difficult. Moodle, Microsoft 365, how do we, one platform, that, that with the educators and our learners are using a combination of the applications within the two of them. And that's something that is going to be an ongoing conversation. And we're talking up to this point really to ourselves. So we're trying to reach out what is best practice out there. So coming to these are really valuable for us, these sort of webinars. The standardization of sites is definitely something that is going to happen in relation for ourselves because of the resources that is needed to support our sites. So as it's been mentioned throughout, we have so many sites that if a plugin happens in one, so we're looking at that Moodle board. So we know that if that goes into one site, how do we replicate that throughout them all and get the learning from that? So within our community there, we can sort of uh, share that information and then with a Moodle sort of coordinator coordinating all that. Engagement with other ETVs and higher eds, what is it? What does this best practice look like? Because that's what we're striving for, and to obviously to sh share our learning. Um, the learner experience, like what does our students want? What sort of tools do they like using? And listening to them. So we, they, currently they have a combination of tools from our 365 platform and also from the Moodle. So we're listening to what they actually like using and also our educator. What do they need? Like it's really hard to, it's really, 
it's, it's, it's challenging to support all the different sites and all the different sort of plugins and from the two applications and two platforms. So really we're trying to engage with everybody to see what that looks like and done through a coordinator of such within the system. So excellent, Michael. Um, the challenges. I, I, I would imagine challenges uh, is everyone is experiencing similar sort of challenges in relation to what applications we should be using. Like even in the last discussion, like Padlet and Moodle board, decisions have to be made somewhere. And like by, by engaging in these challenging sort of conversations and looking at what's out there, I suppose that's what we're trying to do, inform ourselves what's best. And um, aligning the two platforms is the key and to simplify as much as we can. There is many different applications that for teaching learning assessments. We're trying to simplify it. We have a technology way that we're sort of incorporating in to say to our educators, listen, we have numerous applications that we know you could use, but if we all use the same, then we can support each other. Um, the practices that we support, the practices of what's, what are going on in our colleges, and obviously our learners and educators and resources. Resources is always going to be a challenge. We don't have the resources, maybe what higher eds might have in relation to support and move on the ground. We have fantastic um, support from Solace and uh, innovation as well. So just to engage in and communicating with them. Right, last one. And the opportunities, I suppose accessibility in UDL um, with all virtual learning environments platforms to improve, like they can improve the accessibility assistance as a default, that it's, this, it's the first part of it, what we think about. Um, the inter-organization openness to share between ETBs and higher eds as well, and the new government department combining FETs and higher eds, we'd love the support from you, from everyone within this sort of community of how best we could sort of progress in this space. Um, embrace the culture of collaboration and sharing internally. We're doing that, and we obviously want to do it externally. Um, and to embrace the culture of success, what's happening on the ground, and also those failures, so we can learn from it. Uh, we've absolutely amazing support networks within our organization, from our IT department to our professional de development, how we can actually get the support needed to get that out on the ground. And I'll just leave it with our initiatives. We're always trying new things, like the Moodle board. I'm pretty sure now at our next Moodle admin, that will be brought up. Someone had mentioned the Moodle board. Oh, did you hear about this? Because we use Padlet. Now have we an opportunity? Now, we, if we didn't come to a community like this, we probably, how long would it take us to get to know about that? You know? Um, we have a very active Microsoft team where people are posting in comments all the time about what's going on in this space. So that's where we're, we're always trying to bring up new initiatives. And then I'll just finish on our staff and our learners. I suppose our staff, the positive, um, willing, appreciative, that's who we're dealing with. Everything, they are the core to sort of communicate and to sort of collaborate with us on any sort of these initiatives. And that's where we try to drive our resources and support and then our learners to give them a nice fluid experience using digital technologies that it's not complicated that the, te the tech is there but the learning is that what we keep that that's the focus the learning the tech is just an uh, the add-on so they don't really want to know about moodle or microsoft 365 they just want to know is what do you want us to do in relation to the technology and we try to streamline that and make it as simple as possible um I probably spoke at a record speed there, but that was because of my, uh, you know, the beginning and um, using this laptop excuses, but I do actually have a new laptop today. But anyway, it's muting itself for some reason. Um, you can stop sharing that. Uh, the last slide, Michael, if you want. Thanks a million, Michael, as well. 